Tonight is the fourth night of Somali Week Festival 2019, and I hope you guys have been enjoying so far all the amazing events. The incredible artist is here. I'm always excited during this time, um, and I really um, would like to thank you for coming. Um, what I would like to say is um, I had the chance to see um, a city caught in the middle today earlier and it was nothing short of an amazingness, uh, a beautiful piece of work that I'm really uh, looking forward for you guys to watch it. Uh, so please welcome, uh, it's a treat, enjoy, think about it. <coughs> Um, let's discuss this. I think um, the idea, no, I, I, whenever we talk about refugees, it, it always like, it's close to our hearts because a lot of us, majority of us are refugees or were refugees at some point. So um, please feel free to ask any questions and welcome again. Let me not talk too much. Um, thank you. The refugee camp in northeastern Kenya is one of the oldest and largest refugee settlements in the world. It's amazing. They've literally established a city within a region that didn't exist in Kenya before the refugees came. But there's no opportunities in refugees camp. My name is Maulid Fajale. In this documentary, I'll take you through the complex camp that I grew up in and show you how the refugees have turned this temporary settlement into a thriving city. So, Qaybta Hekta, we have a discussion, inshallah. Um, you can probably talk a bit more now that you watch the documentary. Um, I would like to invite the man of the hour, Mawlid Hajale, um, who did this amazing work, but also Dr. Idil Arsman, um, who is a big part of this. Um, please, guys, welcome. <laughs> guys, if I introduce um, Mawlid and Dr. Idil, um, they really don't need no introduction, but I will just indulge you. Uh, Mawlid is a Somali journalist. <laughs> we know he's Somali. Um, and a digital producer, mainly covering humanitarian news and the Horn of Africa. He writes for The Guardian and contributes to various media organizations. He has also worked with the UN in Somalia and in Kenya. Um, also, he's many other things, but he's really too humble to share it with us. Uh, please welcome him. Um, also, um, I'm assuming majority of you um, know Dr. Idil. Uh, if you are from SOAS, maybe um, she taught many of us. Um, um, like in, um, a few years ago, actually, I was here. I remember I was in the audience. Uh, and for some reason, a few years ago feels like a long time to me. I feel like I was really young, but it was just a few years ago, like a couple of years ago. Um, and she was here, uh, and I was listening to her speak. and. Up to now, I'm really inspired. Um, so uh, please welcome her as well. So guys, as you watch the documentary, um, there's many um, interesting points. Um, what I, um, the themes that always come up, um, but also there was a lot of facts uh, to back it up. Um, it was educational, informative, a um, few times entertaining. I know the topic of refugees can be very um, 
sad, um, but they were really good moments. Um, I would really like to um, ask Mawlid about the whole process of doing such an immense work, the process of, of, of putting together such um, a great piece of work, um, how long it took him, but also the name of the documentary. I think that's what really caught my eye in the first place. Um, a city caught in the middle. How did it come about? Um, you know, it literally is. Um, let me give the mic to you because you would explain it better than me. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Aisha. Um, thank you, Dr. Edil, for coming all the way from Leicester. Um, I'm really humbled and it's a pleasure having you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, thanks to Somali Week Festival for hosting us and for um, it's a real pleasure to collaborate with you tonight to launch our documentary um, uh, in this um, beautiful uh, house. Um, the film is a real life story that was inspired by my life back in, in, in that refugee camp. And the reason why I called it a city is because it's been there for almost 30 years now. And the people who've lived there have made it to be a city, even though they are faced with all sorts of challenges, political challenges, and also humanitarian challenges. And, 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 and I call it a city because it has all the components, all the characteristics, all the features that any city has. In terms of population, in 2011, it was almost half a million people were living there. If counted in, the Kenya, uh, uh, in Kenya, it would be the third largest city in Kenya, after Nairobi, Mombasa, Dada. And 97% of the people there are Somalis. It was meant to be a temporary settlement. Um, to host people from the conflict in 1991, then it became uh, the world's largest at some point. Um, until recently, after the Syrian conflict and the South Sudanese um, uh, the conflict, and it's caught in the middle of <coughs> Kenya's political um, ambition and the, the 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 current wrangles you have seen um, uh, the maritime dispute between Kenya and Somalia, and also it has also cut in the middle of a wider regional and, and global political um, um, and, uh, perspective, if you like, because of the global refugee uh, migration and how it has all turned um, uh, political uh, from the 2015 European refugee crisis that you have seen, and also um, when the European Union tried to give money to Turkey to stop people from uh, crossing the Mediterranean Sea, then Kenya said, we also need our share. We're keeping large number of Somali refugees here, so we need that money to keep them here. So they used the practice of security, humanitarian needs, and all of that. So they were caught in the middle of all this. But, but these people are human beings. They are people who need all the opportunities in life, and they're trying so hard to make a living. They're trying so hard to make a home out of a very isolated, semi-arid uh, region in northeastern Kenya. So that's how. I thought about the, 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 the name. Um, so without um, going too much into the details of the whole um, um, documentary and how it is done, I would like to mention my friend Saeed Faddeye, or Faddeye, I, have, I always have a problem pronouncing his surname. He also has a problem pronouncing my surname, which is Hujale. So it, it works for both of us, so I can, I can play with it. So Saeed Faddeye, who is an amazing Somali filmmaker, a great friend of mine, um, he's not with us tonight here. He was supposed to be here, but he's um, uh, caught up with other stuff doing uh, some work in, in, uh, in Somalia. He's between Nairobi and Mogadishu at the moment. So on his behalf, I would like to say thank you, and he will join us in the um, coming uh, screenings in other cities, inshallah. Um, so I would like to just highlight a few points uh, and talk about the future of the DAP. I'm sure, I believe by now you have an idea of the whole concept and, and what's going on there. But where are we going from here? The current situation is very, um, it, it's in the, the people there are in dilemma, basically, because they cannot go back to Somalia and they cannot um, integrate into the um, wider Kenyan society. 
and uh, Kenya is using them as a um, bargaining chip, as Dr. Idel rightly mentioned in the documentary. So globally, the, the, the United Nations and the international community are trying to um, fr frame uh, a, a framework, design a framework that can be used to govern the whole global migration. So it's not just a Somali issue, it's something that is affecting the whole world at the moment. As we speak, there are over 70 million people displaced around the world. So um, Somalia, the Somali refugee situation is just one of them, even though it is one of the most protracted refugee situation in the world. And two years ago, the international community came together at the UN General Assembly and agreed on a, on a shared framework, uh, a shared responsibility, a framework where they can share the burden and support the host countries to do more to help these refugees. And they've come up with a global compact. And then out of that global compact, the, the, the so-called um, uh, comprehensive refugee response framework was developed. Some countries were already using this kind of framework informally, like Uganda and other countries, they, were, they had an open door policy where refugees can come, like the South Sudanese refugees living in Uganda, they were allowed to um, do everything they can in terms of work and employment, movement, all the basic things that they, they, they need. But now they, 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 the UN tried to formalize this process. Many countries are, are reluctant. Ethiopia started already adopting this, but Kenya said yes to this policy, but not in the DAP. They said we would only do this, implement this uh, a concept in Kakuma, which is another camp in the northwestern part of Kenya. The DAB, because they said it's security uh, sensitive, because it's close to the border, and the large number of Somalis who are living there have um, uh, welcomed terrorists, and, and because it's um, situated along the porous border in Somalia, they said because of all that. But it's just an excuse from my personal point of view and my uh, from experience point of view. And also, there has never been any single Somali refugee from the DAP who is convicted in a court of law of any, uh, any terrorist activity. So in that case, they're just using it to make ex excuse to push their own agenda. Because whenever they have an issue with the Somali government, they use the DAP, we're hosting your people, you're doing this, give us the Badr Nasir. So, uh, it's interesting. Um, now, when they said we will close the camp, um, the international community human rights organizations um, uh, complained about it. They, they, they filed a law, um, a, a legal case against uh, this um, illegal, um, unconstitutional uh, decision, and then the, the high court, the Kenya High Court, said no. Even though Kenya High Court said no, still behind the scenes, refugees are being coerced to go back to Somalia. Kenya is determined to close this camp. I, I, I had the idea of maybe they want to do this uh, and to get some money, but recently I, ha I got the sense that they really want to shut down. Um, but the UN is trying to, um, trying to um, push them to integrate. So what they want to do is send some to Somalia um, and also integrate the rest into the Northeastern. But it's a huge logistical nightmare. They cannot just move 250,000 people in one day. Um, so that's what's going on right now. And, 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 and for us as, 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 as Somali um, and journalists, the, the diaspora community, uh, we need to step up and, 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 and give our support and, and, and a voice to help these people. Uh, and my role as a journalist is that I need to uh, humanize these people who are, who are living there. Because Kenya is, is, has, even though they generously hosted them, but they have been trying so hard, the Kenyan media and other uh, media, to paint a very negative picture in this camp. And they were saying these people are economic burden, but what you have seen was different. So that is um, our role to, 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 to show the human side, to show these people they're hardworking and they're able to stand on their own feet and all they want is just to, the rights they deserve. And that is why if you may have noticed that the names of the people I was trying to put what they are, businesswomen, student, and that is what you don't see in other media. 
And I also was very glad to interview uh, Dr. Idil, who has done a, a lot of research into this migration um, issue, especially in the Horn of Africa, uh, to make sure we get Somali voices, Somali experts, and, 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 and to put a human face into the whole um, uh, situation. So um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you so much, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Aisha. Thanks, Mulid. Um, that's that's that was insightful, um, Dr. Edel. Uh, as we watched the documentary, we came across uh, many <coughs> powers. Kenya wanting it to close, the UNHCR decreasing its aid, Donald Trump banning the Somali refugees, Somalia not being safe enough for them to go back, um, not belonging anywhere. Um, what's your and we've, we've seen you analyze the situation for us within, within the documentary. Um, what's your reflection on it uh, as a whole piece? Well, I, I, thought, I thought this was a magnificent piece of work. I'm sure it took you guys a long time to actually put it together, to find the people, to get the people to agree, <laughs> to talk to you. It's a very sensitive subject. Uh, so I want to start by commending you guys, you and Saeed for, uh, for doing a tremendous job. Uh, I <laughs> you know, as, as a media and communication scholar, you know, I, I pay attention to uh, not just the subject, but also the content and who are the content narrators, who are the spokespeople that are sourced to tell these stories, because every story has so many different angles that it can be told from. And Dadaab is no different. It's been told for as long as Dadaab has existed, its story has been told. Uh, but it's often told by people who either don't come from Dadaab, uh, who can't relate to Dadaab on an individual level or a lived experience level. There's a lot of people that have sympathy and can have an empathetic approach to telling stories, but it's very different when the story is told by the people who have lived it and who now have the experience to go back and actually tell it. So this is why I think it's really important that you know, we support narratives that are told by the Somalis about Somalis. Somali issues can be told and delivered by Somali people. I think that's the key thing that I take away from, uh, from this uh, documentary. And I really hope that you guys go around as many cities as possible uh, to, to drive uh, the reach of, of the documentary. So what I take away from it are, are a number of things. One is the element of humanizing that you've just explained. You know, a lot of the times when stories are being told about Dadaab, the refugees are statistics. They are told, you know, you've got 500,000 people that are living here. Uh, X amount of them have come from South Central Somalia. X amount of them have come from, you know, Lublin. X amount. So it's told in very statistical, factual terms. You'll see graphs, charts, things like that. So what I really liked is, is that, you know, the, the refugees weren't just refugees on a map with dots telling you where they're located. They're, they're people. We know their names. We know what they do. We know the activities that they participate in. So we now have an, an inside, uh, inside exposure to the lived experience of the people of, of Dadaab throughout the generations. And what I find particularly heartening is to see the resilience of these people. Um, you know, it, I can't imagine how you can live in, in a confined space like that for 30 years we're talking third generation or so, second generation that, that is now experiencing Dadaab, of that life in limbo. So you, you're neither here nor there. And you cannot plan a future, you cannot plan an existence, and you still have to live. It's a very difficult predicament to be in. But they still managed to actually thrive to the level where that camp is now a city that is as large as the third city in the entire Kenyan country. That I find astonishing. They have thriving businesses, they have thriving youth activities, they've got uh, all, you know, a lot of their basic needs being met by themselves, 
They've got their own schools that they run. They've got their own madrasas. They've got their own businesses. They're generating their income. And they're circumventing the restrictions that are imposed upon them. You know, when you're told you do not have citizenship, they didn't just sit down and take it. They said, okay, what can we do with these restrictions in place? And so they forged connections with the local Kenyan population. They managed to create employment opportunities and incomes for them. Uh, so for me, that I find uh, you know, extremely inspiring. But it's also a very sad story. Uh, what, I, what I also take away from here is the, the lack of connection between the policies that are being cooked up in Brussels, in Nairobi, in New York, in London, and the connection, the realities on the ground. You have policies, I mean, I remember when the tripartite agreement was signed, for example, back in 2014 between UNHCR, Kenya, Somalia, and the uh, stakeholder uh, institutions such as the EU, where you know, there was an agreement uh, created where the people can, can either be integrated, they can uh, either go back to Somalia voluntarily, uh, or they can be re resettled in a third country. The one that was really pushed was the voluntary repatriation to a country that is still very volatile. And so, as we've seen with the lady who was talking about that, she actually went to Mordishu and then had to come back because she's still you know, running away from violence, the violence that she initially escaped. So she's now coming back for a second time. But she's finding doors being locked, physically as well as materially. She hasn't got access to the resources to actually re-establish herself in Dadaab. And so what we're finding here is the superpowers using these people to actually uh, meet their own interests and, fight and, and use them as bargaining chips. Uh, and, this, and these are the lives of people who have been there for, for many, many years, and we're talking an endless future that doesn't have an end point. There's no uh, timeline as to when a decision is going to be reached for them to have some sort of future, whether it's going to be in Kenya, whether it's going to be in Somalia. But what I find particularly problematic is that a, a policy is being pushed that is, not, that is going to be to the detriment of the refugees themselves. And this policy being that they should go back to Somalia, despite the fact that Kenya themselves acknowledge that it is still a volatile uh, situation and filled with, 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 uh, with instability. And so it, that contrasted with people that are so active. I mean, if Kenya you know, took a, a sort of Ugandan style approach, they themselves could really benefit from the contributions that, that the refugees would make. They are extremely entrepreneurial, they, they are very economically savvy, and they are people that can contribute to the growth of the Kenyan economy. So it, you can see that you know, Kenya is even going against their own interest by not acknowledging the needs and the rights of these citizens. So I, I want to conclude my comments with, with, with those reflections, and, and I just want to say that I think what you guys have done is a tremendous job, and I want to commend you for it, and I hope that you guys will continue shedding lights to these kinds of stories. Thank you. I think they, were, um, they said everything, um, but also, there were a few humorous um, points. I think the, um, what it depicted is how Somalis, wherever we are, we're always interested in politics. Um, and I really like how um, your, <laughs> yes, the UK, <laughs> I like how um, Somali refugees in the Dab want Kenya to accept them. But then when they look at Brexit, they think, oh, you know, Britain should leave the EU because all these people are coming to the UK and taking the jobs of, of the British people. It's, it's, it's really interesting, you know. Um, for the Kudirka, wallahi, <laughs> manihin. Um, so I, I think, I think, yeah, I work, um, well, making um, the storytelling um, was something else that really um, captured my attention. You know, I, I couldn't stop watching it yesterday. And anyways, refugee stories are quite sad and um, they might touch you. So if you feel like you need a, to go and, you know, uh, get fresh air, please feel free. Um, however, we are going to open the floor to you now. Any questions that you guys have, um, any remarks that you want to add, um, 
Please, uh, feel free. My question was, I wanted to ask if you read the book City of Thorns, which is um, talking about nine lives in Dab Dab, and whether you thought that was an accurate representation, seen as um, you guys have exper you've experienced Dab Dab yourself. Who is that question to, by the way? Oh, to anyone. Yeah. All right. Uh, Fatima, go ahead. Hey, assalamu alaikum. Um, I really appreciate the film and the discussion afterwards um, from uh, from both of you. This question's for both of you, actually. It's in regards to the role of like media and journalism, particularly the new emerging form of humanitarian journalism, um, and how that can help in terms of advocacy and changing the opinions of those in charge. Yeah, you know when I when I said uh, you know there are uh, there are a lot of non Somalis who can tell the Dadab story from a, a sympathetic position. Ben's book is what I actually had in mind. You know he lived with them for uh, for about nine months, chronicling the stories that he was picking up. So he was someone who actually spent time and an effort to try and be as authentic as possible. But he's still a British guy uh, who, who who brings a level of privilege with himself. Uh, as he's able to come in and leave Dadaab as he pleases, right? So uh, to me, what's really important is the fact that Molid himself comes from Dadaab. He's lived there. He's experienced it. Everything that they were telling him, he knew himself. He could relate to them. And then now, as a journalist, he has the experience and the skills to then tell their stories, not just from a professional perspective, but also from a lived experience perspective. That's why I was saying it was really important that we, we take ownership of how the narrative is shaped when it comes to telling Somali stories. So as, as much as I have a lot of respect, I mean, I, a lot of my work you know, takes cue from, from the work that others have done, scholarship that has been produced by non-Somalis uh, about the Somali uh, migration issues. Um, so there's a lot to be learned and there, there's a lot to be taken from those stories, but there's a big gap that needs to be filled by Somali expertise and scholarship. And that's what the work of Molid uh, and others are, are filling, I think. Uh, in terms of the uh, humanitarian media, uh, influencing opinion makers. It's a growing field. There's the, I think there's now a, a, a big project that's actually hosted at City University in their journalism department, exclusively dedicated to humanitarian journalism. It's the kind of work that Irin News uh, does. Um, so it's a growing field. It's a, it's a growing field that focuses a lot on humanizing the stories of, of people affected by conflict and disasters and um, existential crises. So, but I still think that it, it, it's, it's going to take some time until it has the, the weight of mainstream media. So a story that is told by it in news, for example, is not going to have the same reach and impact as a story that's broken by the BBC. So we still need both of them uh, to tell those stories. Uh, I think in, it, it also is, is important that you get the right people to tell the, the, the stories themselves. So who you interview is just as important as what the interview is about or the content that you're covering. <laughs> From that perspective, humanitarian uh, media is doing a good, uh, a good job in terms of focusing on the people, but the model that they're following is still, it's still a new uh, environment, and so they very much still need to work in tandem with mainstream media organizations. Um, um, uh, City of Thorns, I've read that book and I know um, personally some of the main characters that were featured in that, in, in that, that, that um, uh, book. And I think um, Ben has done a great job in, in, in not only um, um, telling the stories of the refugees, but the thing I support about that book is that he's really, uh, he was very hard on, on, on Kenya. And the book came at a time when um, when there was a lot of um, um, uh, uh, um, news about closure of the camp. Um, so that's why I, I, I endorsed that book. Uh, on the humanitarian journalism and um, humanitarian reporting, as Edil um, has just uh, pointed out, I think the, the challenge would be all these big international humanitarian organizations, from the UN to the big institutions, all of them have their own media department, and they really want to take over everything that comes independently. Eating 
um, which Edil uh, just mentioned, uh, has changed their name from um, it to the new humanitarian, and which I've, um, uh, I, I used to report for them. I still I do write for them uh, as a freelance uh, now. They used to be part of the UN, OCHA, and because of editorial uh, policy um, issue, they had to um, uh, leave the UN. Because UN was paying their funds, they tried to control their, 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 their independence reporting. And that's why they had to leave them and stand on their own and, and, and source uh, independent funding. So they, that's why they now do um, um, analysis uh, independently from the UN. So what these um, institutions would, would do is they will try to absorb them. And it, it, it also, I think, uh, relates to other sectors. We have seen during the 2016-17 farming or drought in Somalia that many young uh, people from the diaspora started very good initiatives. And many of them were absorbed by the UN because they see the threat of Somalis standing on their own, on their own feet. So what I would like to um, say to the young lady who just asked the question is if you are in, uh, thinking of doing humanitarian reporting and journalism is very good thing but what you need to be careful is just to not to be absorbed by a big institution thank you a very good question and um, yeah uh, what we are now trying to do is just to um, continue doing screenings in different parts of the world in in in, in the uk we're also doing it in, in in the states we're also doing it in kenya after the screenings then we are hoping to pitch it to big in media like the bbc or jazeera which we are now talking to them we're now in the process of talking um, uh, to them and in doing so, we are trying to uh, generate um, this discussion among the Somalis and also reach out to non-Somalis. And there are currently a lot of debates going on in, in Kenya about this um, reintegration um, and um, solution for, for refugees in, in Kenya. And because Kenya has been telling this, 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 uh, this story of refugees are bad and they are like uh, uh, disturbing our environment, they are um, economically um, burdening our local community. We need to change that narrative as well because refugees in the dub, they pay taxes to, to, to the local authority and no one knows about it. And that money never comes back to the, to the streets. Um, and it, this tax is not even um, regulated. These Kenyans come every year to the local shops that you have seen in the camp and they look at the, at the building and they're like, bring $10,000 to, the, not 10,000, but 10, 10, 10, 10 pounds. So it's not regulated. And, and whatever goes out of this, and it goes in the millions actually, in, 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 in Kenyan shillings. So that is what we're trying to, 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 to tell the world and the policymakers who are working on these durable solutions. And we want Kenya to accept this, they already know, but we want others to know so that they can be uh, pressured to, to do that. Thanks. There's a very famous phrase called, within media and communication studies, called follow the money, right? Follow the money means that, you know, the, 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 the policies that are being implemented by international organizations such as IOM are connected to the funding streams that they are getting. And those funding streams are then connected to the policies of the generating countries, right? So if you trace that funding route, you can see the intentions behind it, right? And, and because the funding is what all of these NGOs and international agencies depend on, it's not always in tandem with the needs and the interests of the people that they are serving. Now, some of the work of IOM, IOM is actually working, like the work that they've just recently completed in Baidawa, uh, with in, 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 uh, in collaboration with uh, the uh, Southwest State Administration. They've actually established a land that is freehold, bought for exclusively the benefit of the uh, IDPs that are being resettled there. So it gives them a sense of permanency. People can live there. The houses and the grounds upon which these houses are built is theirs. So they have a level of permanency. And that means that they can then depend on 
their own self-reliance so they can plan their future knowing that they have this plot of land and the house that's built on it for themselves. They can leave it with their children, they can start plotting, uh, the, they can start farming the land, they can start growing on it. So, um, so there are some policies that work. And I, and, and I still don't think that that's going to meet all of their needs, but it's a very good starting point. Now, on the flip side, you then also have ad hoc policies, like IOM's Quest Media work, for example. They're going out and they're, you know, uh, the idea, the intention itself is good to bring in professional diasporas, uh, you know, that are originally from Somali to come back and contribute to particularly skilled areas. But that too does not filter into the, the local dynamics that are going on. There's a lot of skilled people locally that are educated locally, maybe have gone to university in the neighboring countries and then have come back that are also looking for work, but they're excluded from that. And so that then builds tension between the diasporas and the locals. It creates a sense of uh, elitism. It creates a sense of uh, inequality that perpetuates the existing inequality that already exists economically, socially, politically. Um, so the, the, there's, there's a number of conflicting issues going on when it comes to the relationship between international agencies and their engagement with Somalia and the Somali territories at large uh, in the region. Uh, and, I th and I think that, that needs some, some, some unpacking beyond the time that we have here. But I hope that's kind of answered a little bit of what you were looking for. Um, I just want to add um, um, repatriation uh, is back to the country of origin is the most sustainable option of all the durable solutions that, are, that refugees have, including the in integration and resettlement. Resettlement has really shrinked so much that people have lost hope of going out of their refugee camps. And this is not something that is particularly um, isolated to the Somali refugees, uh, the repatriation and resettlement thing. Um, we have seen um, Af Afghan refugees being forced from Pakistan back to um, Afghanistan, which is not safe. Um, uh, refugees from um, Europe who failed to get the asylum are also being repatriated. And it also comes down to what Idil just said, follow where the money is. Countries of origin, I blame Somalia government for signing that tripartite agreement in 2013, that government. It was a very hasty uh, decision. It was all about money. The, this European um, uh, Union and, and the UN were all um, eager to pay money for people to be repatriated because they, want these pe they, want, they, they, want, they don't want these people to live and come to Europe. So they have this uh, fear of all refugees from Africa and Asia uh, flocking to, 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 to Europe, which is not true. The vast majority of refugees live in countries um, near the conflict areas. It's only a tiny percent of a percentage of refugees who come. Uh, like in 2015, when Europe was talking about European refugee crisis, there were just um, a million, I think, or so, who came to uh, to the EU from 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 Syria, for example. And we have 500 million people in the whole of Europe. That that will be a, a drop into the ocean. So coming back to the point of the repatriation, it's very frustrating, and the people. They call it voluntarily, but it's not, because the conditions the people have are so bad that they opt just to go back. Because in the DAF, for example, even though the UN explicitly says it's voluntarily and the people are not forced, still people feel like the life in the DAF became so difficult. And many of the NGOs went to Somalia to get funding for the people who were repatriated. That's why many of the services were reduced, including the food rations, up to 30% and other um, uh, needs. Then people would have the only option just to sign up to this repatriation. So that is the problem. So they've been basically forced again to migrate. That's a really good question. And it, it also relates to, um, I didn't elaborate on it, but the comment I was making about uh, the way that the Ugandan government is is, is approaching the re the refugee issues from uh, refugees coming from South Sudan, that really speaks to the local population being empowered to solve local issues. Hafta Sheikh is an example of that. The same goes for for a, a number of refugee uh, settlements that uh, have been locally resolved across 
across East Africa. The problem with the DAB is that there's too many international, regional, uh, and national level uh, interests within which the power lies. So the power brokers are not with the people who this issue is affecting. The power brokers are in New York, they're in London, they're in Nairobi, they're in Addis, and so on. And so an issue that can find local solutions is, is not being locally resolved because the power does not lie there. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So Kenya, interestingly, is a signatory to the 1951 UN Convention uh, on the Rights of Refugees, which um, stipulates that refugees have the right to move within the country of, uh, that, that's hosting them. But at the same time, they have been implementing uh, an incumbent policy for a long time. And no one is doing anything about it. I think the only reason they're doing it is just because, in my opinion, when you keep people in one place, you have a control of them. Mm -hmm. You control whatever goes in there in terms of resources. You control um, their movement. And you can keep them for your own political gain, I think. So that is the underlying issue. But at the same time, what happened was the UN and other international organizations that came in to help these people, they have not said, um, we would not go into these camps. We need these people to be integrated as part of the international humanitarian law so that we can support you. They ended up going to the camps and, 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 and following Kenya's uh, um, rules. And because I think maybe they didn't have another, another option, but Kenya continues to uh, put these restrictions on refugees, even though they recently said we will try to integrate them when, when, when the, the UN started giving more money to host, host, host countries. Um, I can't think of any other reason it's other than keeping them to control and get money. So that's how I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it. Um, hi, uh, Noli, thank you for the documentary. I had a comment, actually, which came from the Kenyan question. Um, I th the, the reason for the Kenyan policy, I mean, Kenya didn't have a refugee law for a long time, um, until 2007 or 8, anyway. Mm -hmm. But they still continued kind of keeping people in camps and not letting them in, and whatever, letting them kind of uh, move around. I think the reason for the Kenyan policy, that's a comment and I have a question, I think it's to do with the Kenyan problem with the Kenyan Somalis. I think it boils down to that. I think because Kenya is fairly democratic, integrating 500,000 or 250,000 people will just affect the demographics. And you know, there's a whole kind of politics surrounding the census question, you know, the numbers of Somalis are going up. So I think that's where it stems from. And it's really a sad story because this land that these people are living, of course, belong to Kenyan Somalis. The Kenyan government doesn't offer them anything. So just that's a comment. My question is, what is the role of Somali government? I mean, has the Sheikh visited the place? But is what are they doing? These are Somalis. They're spending a lot of money on other things. Can they not prioritize these people? 250, you know? These are, these are not just numbers, these are people, as you said. So my, that's my question. Thank you. Um, we, we are really short on time, so I'm going to take Bordery's question as well. And Sorry about that. Thank you very much, uh, Moulit and Said Fadaye and all, all who are involved in making this film. Uh, actually, uh, my comment was answered by this gentleman. The Somali sensitivity in Kenya is real, mm -hmm. and it has been there for a long time, from 1960s up to now. It's very sensitive. The, the whole northeastern North Kenya is politically sensitive, economically sensitive, demographically sensitive, and that must be one reason. It must be there, always. Uh, what I want to ask you is, the Somali refugees changed the whole east, uh, northeastern part of Kenya. They changed the whole uh, region economically, demographically, and they empowered local people too. 
I remember, I remember, I, I'm not that young. I, I was there in 1992. By the time we came to the, into the border, the local people could, could identify us. There you are from Somalia. Everybody knew you, the way you look, the way you dress, the way. Within 10 years, everything changed. The whole Garissa region changed. So even the Kenyan uh, authorities could not tell who is refugee and who is uh, local. And there were lo many local people who were in the refugee camps too, and it's still there. Thousands of them. Some even Kenyan uh, born people get resettlements, and they're living in the West now. So it's uh, this Kenyan sensitivity of the Somali uh, region is multi-dimensional. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about the local Kenyans who are benefiting from the refugee camp? What, what would they do? How, is that in the, in the conversation? That's my question. Guys, please keep brief. All right. I'm just going to say uh, two comments to, to, uh, towards the two questions, then Mulida Dankusu Dibia. I'm really glad both Bodari Yuwalak and Halkahad and Kahadlai and Somali, Somali Ken, the Somalis in Kenya. And the fact that Kenya always had a problem with the Somalis. You know, I mean, they've been there for generations now. So for, even if you put aside the refugee uh, dynamics, yani Somali, the rare Kenya have been there for generations. And they're still, you know, hyphenated. Somali Kenyan. You don't hear Luo Kenyan. You don't hear, you know, uh, <laughs> Kukiu Kenyan. They're Kenyans, but Somalis are Somali Kenyan. You know, this is what, this is one of the things I find extremely fascinating. And there's a documentary that Hal uh, Addo did called uh, "Not Yet Kenyan," I think, right? Yeah, it was very touching. Wallah, it was very, very moving, and it shows you how, you know, the multifaceted dimension that you just talked about of how Somalis are viewed in Kenya, and that, that obviously then trickles down to how the refugees in Dadaab are being portrayed and received and treated. Um, in terms of the question about the Somali government's role, um, I think there's a, a, a big gap between the perception or expectations of the Somali government and the realities on the ground. The Somali government, in terms of the reality on the ground, only controls parts of Muqtishu. They are very confined in terms of what they can practically affect, right? So we have lots of policies. If you go to any of the administrations, there's a lot of policies and processes that have been put in place. A lot of good work has been, has been done in terms of synchronizing uh, the different agencies and the different institutions and getting them to get to a level where you can see the shape of political institutions taking place. But in terms of implementation, it's a very different story. And so this issue of tackling the Dadaab refugees and helping them to be repatriated into the different parts of Somalia requires the central government to actually have control over the different parts of, of Somalia. And so it, before we ask the question, what can the Somali government do to help them? That's a question that we're going to ask maybe 20 years from now, 15 years from now, because the Somali government has a long way to go to actually establish themselves in terms of uh, influence and power and control across the Somali regions that come under their jurisdiction. Um, so I think the, the, in, in order to solve the Dadaab refugee uh, situation, we're going to need to look outside of the Somali government's influence. Obviously, we need to work with them because if, they're, if we're talking repatriation, you have to work in tandem with them. Um, but we, but the, the, the implementation has to come from, from other sources. So one of the areas that I thought was really um, very hopeful was the IOM uh, example that I gave earlier about some of the refugees who were originally from Beit Labo. They were farmers that have been repatriated uh, to Beit Labo. They, not just from Dadaab, but they were repatriated from Muqtisho and, and other places where they were displaced and they were given a plot of land, they were given housing, they were given uh, uh, schools and, 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 and plots for them to, to actually establish their own religious institutions, uh, healthcare, sanitation. So they've, they've been given a space where they can then re, you know, re-establish their lives and a sense of um, uh, livelihood. I think that sort of model can probably be some, some type of hope that, or that can be uh, uh, re, um, 
re-implemented across across different parts of, of Somalia, but it very much depends on uh, agreements with the local administrations. It very much depends on the availability of enough land. It depends on the will of the people, if they're willing to be repatriated to, to those areas. Uh, and, and obviously the question of conflict and, 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 and having some sort of stability in those regions before anyone can be repatriated anywhere. Uh, I also only have two minutes um, and I, yeah, I'll just, I just want to um, highlight the point about the Somalia um, sensitivity in northeastern Kenya. It's true that um, long before the civil war, Somalia, Kenya, so Kenya had a problem with these people in the NFD region of Kenya. And that, I think, explains some of the underlying issues why Kenya is very, very strict on these refugees. Because currently it happens, um, it affects the local elections, uh, refugees, um, uh, local Kenyans come to the refugee camps uh, to get votes from the local community who live within there. So it all, it's also, I think, something that, um, um, that we need to um, be aware of when we are talking about the integration of refugees. But at the same time, in Kakuma, where we have South Sudanese refugees, who are not sharing, um, they do also share border but don't have any problem. They still keep them in Kakuma. So it's a problem I think Kenya needs to also, um, maybe Kakuma is suffering because of the NFD because if Kenya allows integration for Somali refugees then they would also want um, uh, Kakuma to also be integrated. So um, I think it's a very good uh, point that we understand and, and I think the more we talk about it and the more we come together in forums like this, the, the more we can sensitize people about this issue. And I really appreciate um, your presence. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll give it to Aisha to close. And Saeed Fadeh, sorry, I have to mention, he's not here. He will kill me if I don't mention. Uh, he's up there. Um, and these are his social media um, handles. Saeed Fadeh, those are mine. So please um, add him. Uh, if I don't see people following me tonight, that means you haven't mentioned me. So, <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Thank you guys so much for being here and for watching this amazing documentary, for responding to it. Uh, please keep the discussion going. Um, do whatever you can. Um, and thank you so much because I used to organize this festival. I understand the importance of leaving on time. Um, please make your way out, guys, because 10 o'clock, we have to be out of here. Thank you.